I was shocked. It pulled Pat Burleson right out of the event, which left basically you versus David Moon. So we have the 140-pound high-flying kicker who just took the other biggest guy in the event out of it, and you're getting ready to fight him. What's going through your mind? Well, I knew David Moon was a top fighter in those days. When I talked to Mike Stone a year before, Mike Stone always rated David Moon in the top ten or the top five. He was a pretty consistent winner. He, he was hard to beat. Uh, he had a good sense of time and a good sense of range, uh, a little weak on the defense. Hopefully I could capitalize on that. There's a lot of buildup to this final fight. Let's go ringside with Jim Harrison at the first World Professional Championships in 1968 Grand Championship match. Mr. Trias is our head referee this time. He brings the boys to the position. They bow to the referee. They're saluting to each other. Fighting out of the same, same stance. This means both fighters fighting out of the same direction. These boys are both very strategical fighters. They're watching the eyes, they're watching the hands, they're watching the feet all at the same time. So this is some kind of a break, some kind of a reaction. They're trying to feint each other out to make the other man to defend something that isn't coming. Or they expect something else. Lewis advances, side thrust kick into the kidney area. Seems to hurt David a little bit. Two judges have a red flag up since Lewis is wearing the red sash on his belt. David's trying to catch his breath. Joe caught me with that side kick in the internationals this year. Naturally, it goes in deep. Naturally, these fellows try to pull those blows as much as possible, but I suppose it's only natural that uh, the spirit of mind that they're in, there's going to be some damage done. Well, they're trying to deliver the point before the man can defend or get away from it, and it's really hard to control that close. So back. Joe shuffling forward, using a creeping motion, shuffling from heel to toe. David's moving back. David's changed his stance, so he keeps away from him. Joe advances again. He fakes with a hand. He grabs and throws the sidekick in again. Angel and Steen indicate the point. The point's been awarded to Lewis, the winner of the match. Two sidekicks. It's fascinating to me that in watching David Moon in the previous two fights, he was all over the place. He was playing a distance game. He was mobile. He was everywhere. Against you, he froze. What happened? He did freeze. Um, I'm basically in my zone now. I'm just starting getting warmed up. I'm going back to my old self, and that is just square off, find the range, squeeze the trigger, fight's over. Here I'm choking up, choking up, trying to find a range. I'm trying to reach that impulse hits me where the mind sort of goes blank, goes in and zen state, and then it just automatically triggers the kick. Boom, straight up underneath the arm. He had no defense. According to Jim Harrison, that kick actually broke his ribs. As you'll see in the next clash that he turns the other side forward. It does look like he's uh, a little out of breath here, doesn't it? Yeah, there's something wrong with David, you know. He starts with the left side forward and then he switches, I think, to protect that rib. Again, just set it up, find the range, waiting for the impulse to hit me, boom. It's one of my old favorite moves to grab the guy's lead hand, especially when they wore those gi tops where the sleeve came all the way down to the wrist. Uh, that's not practical at all. It's too easy to grab. You notice the gi I have on is that kendo top. One of the reasons we wear that is to show off the size of the forearms, intimidate the opponent, make it difficult for someone to grab your, your sleeves. That's real cruddy. Major part of the legend of Joe Lewis, of course, is that wicked sidekick. You know, on the very first tournament, I ever fought in California, the International Championships. Uh, one of the toughest men I ever fought. It, all I did was sidekick, sidekick, sidekick. At the end of the match, the judges came up to me and said, Mr. Lewis, why is that all you throw us a sidekick? I said, why not? They can't block it. And they said, yeah, I guess you're right. My first tournament ever, 1966, United States National Championships. The first man to ever score a point on me. It was the last match, the grand championship match. I stepped out of the ring, made a mistake, I turned my back, looked where I was, and he scored a point on me. I was mad. So I came back, we squared off, locked horns. I did a simple technique, reaching, grabbed his sleeve, lift his arm up, sidekick in the match. Same technique that finished David Moon off and gave you the grand championship of the first World Professional Championships. This was actually a paid person. How big was that purse? <laughs> One dollar. But he did, he did it on camera. He said he wanted to make a point that this first time 
uh, a person ever been paid for a tournament match. I had been paid for exhibitions before, but never for a tournament. Well, we've heard the comments from Joe Lewis in 1998. Let's go back to 1968 and hear 23-year-old Joe Lewis's observations as winning the first World Championships. Jim, come on over here for a minute, Joe. Congratulations. Thank you. From professional Good karate. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful job. And uh, of course, it, it made a quick match out of something that we were uh, looking, uh, you know, might go just a little bit longer. I want to explain something. David Moon's a very fast man and a very good counterman. So what I, wanna, what I wanted to do was to play him close and boom, try to use my speed against his speed. In other words, I feel I'm a, a bigger man and a little bit stronger. And therefore, I'd use my force and my size against his speed. Boom. He's a very quick fellow, though. Oh, yes, definitely. Jim, your analysis of the match that we just saw. I think... Uh, Joe usually plays a little more passive game. He waits for his fighter to come to him. And this uh, might have kind of fouled David's strategy up a little bit. And unless you've been standing on the end of Joe's sidekick, it looks pretty fast from the audience. Sure but did. he and I were warming up in the United States Championships one time, and I made up my mind I was going to block it. And I opened up my side, and he kicked me, and I blocked. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. In, in that order. <laughs> How many titles, uh, how many credits do you currently have, major tournament have credits? Eight titles right at the present. Eight? Yes. And, uh, of course, you're, you're not about to retire or leave the sport or anything no, else. No, i got to repay somebody for all these scars on my face now. He's number one. <laughs> Is he? Tell us about somebody else that might be on your mind right now in that connection. Well, we have some top boys out in Los Angeles, Mr. Chuck Norris, who's uh, our present international karate champion, and a uh, very fast boy, uh, very strong, and... Uh, He's been around a long time. He's got real fast hands and real fast kicking techniques. Well, we're looking forward to having Norris on professional karate, too. And in the meantime, congratulations. Thank you. My pleasure. Beautiful job. Congratulations, Joe Lewis. And now for Jim Harrison, this is Fred Everett for professional karate. Joe, you've been around the American tournament karate scene almost from the beginning. Help us put this in perspective. We saw the quality of fighter, the tenacity, the strength, the blood and guts era from 1968. Let's fast forward to now. Help us put it in perspective. Fundamentally, you have more fighters today. Therefore, you've got a much wider crop of top fighters. Back then, there were maybe three, four guys in the entire nation that could give you a problem in a match. Today, there's probably 25 or 30 of them. Uh, so there's more top fighters. And then every now and then, one of those little hot shots in the second notch of fighters, mm -hmm. second ech echelon, could come on and give you uh, a good fight. Back in those days, there was 90% of them were always out of shape and terrible, and you had maybe 10% of them. Today, that second crop is bigger. I felt personally, in my own opinion, the, we put more focus on boldness back then, whereas today, it's a little more focus on what we call flash and style. Mm -hmm. Back then, it's a little more substance. Uh, you popped each other, knocked each other's teeth out, you knocked each other out, as you saw on this tape here. You broke each other's ribs, shake the guy's hand, no big deal. Now they want to throw you out of tournaments, what have you. We even see fights among the parents in the tournaments. You know, so it's a very interesting contrast. On one hand, maybe their technical quality today is a little bit higher. Oh, much higher. But the spirit is so different, the very essence of the event. We were watching the World Championships and getting the sense that these were karate fighters using techniques that they firmly believed in. They actually referred to them as lethal blows, even with the open hand techniques. Yet today it is, as you imply, kind of a flashy pat-a-pat-pat yeah, type you know, in, in, on the tape, things were toned down. You scored a point. You didn't walk around shaking your hand and, and yelling at the audience and calling attention to the judges. Hey, look, I just scored a point. There wasn't that show. There wasn't that flash involved. Uh, again, it's substance. Um, yes, today, you see more combinations being thrown. You see more movement, more lateral motion going around. Um, you'll see the hands higher because you see uh, more higher kicking combinations, what have you. You won't find people in any better shape than you did in the old days, and you won't find any people today who are actually faster than they were in the old days. So the speed has remained the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the size of the fighters you're seeing now today, you're seeing more of the bigger boys. The boys over 200 pounds are looking good. Back in those days, if you're over 200 pounds, you couldn't fight. If you're over six foot two or three, the tall guys uh, didn't mm -hmm. seem to hang in mm -hmm. the tournaments. Today, it's a different ball game. The fighters are becoming bigger. There's more of them, and the big thing is we have 
uh, better teachers, more teachers, people who can speak the English, conceptualize what the heck's going on, therefore you have more better fighters. Let's talk about the flip side. Is there more public interest in this sport than there were, was in 1968? Clearly you said in 1965 there was the wide world of sports debacle. Setting that aside, the people that attended these events, was it a bigger event? Did it have more prestige to it? I mean, we said earlier, I cannot tell you who the top point fighter in the United States is or has been since the 80s. And I don't even know who the current world champions are today, and this is my own sport, so uh, uh, it's one of the things. One of the things I like back in the old days, they always had a tournament queen. Uh, for example, uh, the, the two days before this event, I'd won the uh, United States Karate Championships in Dallas, Texas, and uh, <coughs> the, 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 the tournament queen turned out to be uh, uh, a girl who later starred on Simon and Simon, uh, Jeannie Wilson. She was Miss Texas then. Uh, today, you don't have that anymore. Well, you had the tournament queen. You often had a senator, a local politician, a movie star. Yeah, yes, Elvis yes. Presley showing up. Bruce Lee was there. I remember the first uh, national championships where I was the defending champion. Robert Culp from the I Spy series came as a guest. Uh, Bruce Lee came as a guest. As a matter of fact, that's where I met Bruce Lee for the first time, who later became my teacher. Um, it was real hard getting national coverage on television at that time. Although sometimes you would go to a tournament, there would be four or 5,000 people in the audience. That's hard to get today. Uh, in 1971, I talked to John Martin, who was the president of ABC Wide World Sports at that time. He said, Joe, I will go anywhere in the world and televise in your fights as long as it's not a karate tournament, as long as it was full contact. Boxing, so that's what they wanted to see. They want to see the crash. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating perspective. If you followed the sport through the years, this gives you a great contrast to what was a glorious time, the blood and guts era, the foundation, the pioneers. The spirit was strong, the technique was strong, the tenacity was there. That defined blood and guts. Joe Lewis, thanks so much for sharing your insights on this. Uh, it, it made a huge difference in how we view this. And again, thanks to Jim Harrison for donating this to the Martial Arts Professional Magazine Archives. I'm John Graydon. I've enjoyed it. Thanks so much for viewing.